Still in contact with her? With Marit Larson? That was a really important chapter in my life. It's not always necessary to keep investigating the same collaborations. In late spring, early summer of 1998, Marit Larson and Marion Raven would meet and become fast friends in a little town called Lorenskog in Norway. As both girls had a musical upbringing, the girls would quote unquote naturally start making music together. As an American, it was a little hairy trying to navigate their early careers. I don't speak the language, but I found this video of them in a children's choir in 1995. Why don't they have shoes on? We may never know but these two were in business together for a long time before we heard about them in the States. They did a lot of TV, radio, and musical theater in Norway, but they did eventually become a musical duo. And this bubblegum duo would start off by naming themselves after literal bubblegum. They called themselves Hubba Bubba in honor of their favorite Tigagami. And I'm not sure how long that lasted, but by the time they debuted, they simply called themselves Mara and Marion. They recorded a record at the tiny ages of 11 and 12, and this children's album was nominated for a Norwegian Grammy, so they were quite a accomplished for their tiny ages. After the first album, they started writing pop songs and recording demos, drawing inspirations from bands that wrote their own music like The Beatles and Hansen. One day, a Swedish music manager heard them in their creative process and he snagged one of their demos and took it to New York to shop it to major labels. Atlantic Records decided to bite. They brought the girls over to officially audition and they were offered their first international record deal in the summer of 1998. After they got signed, the label wanted them to have an official group name. They didn't want them to go by Mary and Marion anymore. They originally wanted to be called Eminem, but they had had no idea that there was a candy and a rapper of the same name. So at that point, they asked their fans on their self-made website to participate in a rebranding and one fan came up with M2M. And I do wish that we knew who that fan was so we can officially credit them, but that is when M2M was officially born and they would hop over the border and start recording their first album in Sweden, eventually making their way to London and finally New York. And in going through their album credits, you can really trace the development of this album. Like the song Pretty Boy had a full Swedish team, our song had a full British team, and while they were in London, they worked heavily with Matt Rao, Matt Rowe, who was very famous for working with the Spice Girls at the time, so they were in very good hands. And in total, these two young ladies wrote 30 songs, recorded 16 of them, and 13 of them made it to the album. They have writing credits on all but two tracks. There is one song exclusively written by Marion called Girl In Your Dreams. This was the first song she had ever written at the age of 13, so I think it's really awesome that the label chose to include that in their official album. And quick side story, she wrote this about a boy in school. So he was like totally red in his face like <laughs> and I just sang it for the whole school and I said I wrote this song to a boy that's sitting in the audience and he was like I could not pray for that level of confidence at 13. Atlantic Records executive VP Ron Shapiro boasted that they were real songwriters and musicians. What's a real blessing to us is to see girls this young who have an extraordinary awareness of who they are. After recording the debut album, the girls would fly to California and record their first music video. And in October of 1999, M2M would officially debut with the song, Don't Say You Love Me. The song is very reminiscent of Britney Spears' Sometimes. It oozes purity. It's about telling a guy that you want to take it slow, which is fine by me, better than having minor singing about their cookie. Take it, don't break it. I want to see it, taste it. Dope song, though. The music video has a drive-in theater concept. They gave Merritt a Karen haircut. The video premiered on the WB after an episode of Seventh Heaven. Atlantic Records is owned by Warner Music Group, which is all under Warner Brothers Entertainment, who was distributing the US release of the Pokemon movie. So the WB gave M2M the privilege of having their debut single become the title track of the US movie soundtrack, which was a full 2000s pop roster. An alternate music video was easily made using scenes from the movie inserted onto the theater screen in the music video. And the WB also requested for a lyric change. The song goes from start kissing me. to the less physical Said you love me. in a chat room interview with allpop.com, no affiliation. Marie and Marion said, the Pokemon people didn't find it appropriate to have kissing in the lyrics because it was for younger kids. We think it was stupid. <laughs> the song went gold in the US and peaked at number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100. It also charted in 16 other countries, the highest being their home country of Norway at number two. The second single released was Mirror Mirror in February of 2000. <laughs> This is one of those situations where I think the charts don't reflect the hype that this song truly got. I think being attached to Pokemon made the first single seem so much bigger, but off of my personal memory, take that as you will, I remember this song being way bigger than Don't Say You Love Me. Even more recently on my TikTok account, I got nothing but positive comments for this song, but people were very divided when I posted Don't Say You Love Me. Like Jesus guys, these are still young ladies. Alas, this song charted at number 62 on the Billboard Hot 100, but it was also certified gold, and Billboard reported that this sold over 
600,000 copies, which would be 100K more than Don't Say You Love Me, if accurate, I'd like to believe so. But that just goes to show you like the Billboard charts are fun, but it's not the end all be all. The accompanying music video was a bit more edgy. It was all dark. The opening riff is pretty ominous. <laughs> And I really like how the first single reflected a budding relationship while the second single reflected a love lost. I find like little details like that really satisfying. The same month the video was released, they recorded an episode of Disney's In Concert with the boy band BB Mac. And this grown man got kind of weird with Marion. I'm afraid. I have to hold a hand. Side eye. Side eye. I absolutely love this episode they were in because we were in the Britney era by this time. So I feel like the vocal engineers kind of raised the pitch on their studio voices, making them sound really, really high pitched, specifically Marion and Don't Say You Love Me. Introduced to you by but when you see her actually perform the song, she sounds so normal live. Introduced to you by and she has the greatest head of hair I have ever seen in my life. A month after, in March of 2000, the debut album she of Purple is released. And I absolutely loved this. I do not recall a purple concept with any of their teen pop peers. There was a lot of metallics, a lot of pinks and blues, a lot of white rooms. So I thought this was a stroke of genius and I expected there to be this complex meaning behind it. But when asked, I don't know which one of them said it, but one of them said, we wanted to get a title that expressed that the album is us and through our eyes. I had these purple shades and I thought they were pretty cool. And that explanation absolutely sent me. They are so young and innocent. And we would get a pretty large gap in releases after this. The next single didn't come out until August. I'm not even sure if this one was promoted in the US, but their label did say that they went on a middle school tour. So I'm guessing that took place during this gap of time. But eventually in August, Pretty Boy was released. Oh This is probably the one song I can't do on this album. It's just like too sugary sweet for me. I do have an appreciation for bubblegum pop, but I don't know. It's just like, it's just not my favorite track. You might feel differently. And the music video is absolutely terrifying. I do not understand. I don't. This song also has a Mandarin version. Yeah. They were only given one day to record the song in a language they probably never even attempted to speak before. So kudos to them for that. And they did promote in Asia quite a bit. Thailand, Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Philippines, Korea, Singapore, and Indonesia all got a piece of M2M. And I actually went to the Philippines back in 2019 and in an arcade I went to, they had karaoke booths. And in these booths, they had M2M songs in their catalogs. And I think that is so cool. I always make sure to give credit to the girl groups that were making it internationally before the time of social media. That must have been a really hard grind. They had to tour these countries before there was a demand for them in hopes of gaining fans. They didn't have the luxury of posting beautiful pictures from their home country to a worldwide forum and then seeing where the demand is. They had to travel for months at a time. The song that Marion wrote, Girl in Your Dreams, was also promoted in Asia and they also had an Asian edition album, which I think is so flippin' cute. I'm definitely looking to add this to my collection. Again, not totally sure when the Asian tours began or ended, but I speculate it ended sometime in August. August because in September of 2000, MTV News announced that they were joining the boy band Hanson for their September-October shows. By September, the now critically acclaimed Shades of Purple had exceeded 1 million in sales, and now they were about to tour with one of their inspirations. Things were definitely looking up for them. But while this tour was supposed to open them up to a new audience, it ended up doing the exact opposite. You see, Merritt and Marion started dating two of the Hansons. Marion started dating Zach, and Merritt started dating Isaac. They had all briefly met in Europe prior to this. They all had a dinner date, so it wasn't out of the blue, but it very much seemed out of the blue to Hanson fans. They were not amused by this news. There was said to be heckling during their opening set. Some fans even figured out where Marion's hotel room was and left a note at the door saying stay away from him. So this tour did not do them any favors. And when the tour was over, the girls went back to Norway, but the Hansons invited them to come to their home in Tulsa, Oklahoma for Christmas. Merritt's family allowed her to go, but Marion's mother did not. And after that, Zach started to ice her out completely. It seems as though he never even officially broke up with her, he just stopped talking to her. And while Merritt was allowed to join the festivities, her and Isaac would get a bit more serious, but I believe they dated under two years. It 
wasn't the longest. This whole situation had to have been really crushing for Marion because before they even became famous themselves, they were big Hanson fans and she actually dreamed of dating him and it became her reality, but he just did not end things in the most respectable of ways. That would definitely leave a bruise on my little heart. But like a true artist, the situation would go right into her writing and it would manifest later in her career. But before we go there, the Shades of Purple era was not done. The next single promoted was Everything You Do. Everything you do, everything that you do. And I really enjoy this song. Still eyeing world domination, they had a Spanish version recorded called Todo Lo Que Haces. I seen that they had promoted in Chile and I believe Mexico City, but I couldn't find like a full itinerary. And their performance there was fantastic. The audience was loving it. The music video is really cute. I love the makeup. The frosty lip gloss is so nostalgic. I love the first outfits, the second outfits not so much. And Merit has on the most confusing top I have ever seen in my life. The song didn't do much for them. It peaked at number 21 on the Billboard Hot Dance single sales. I think a misstep on management was trying to have them everywhere at once for their album rollout. I mean, they pretty much had no choice at that time, but I think it was a losing battle because they were spending months and months in Asia and America just kind of forgot that they were around. Unfortunately, when you're out of sight, you're out of mind. Bewitched had a similar journey. If you caught my last video, they were trying to balance the UK and the US and they said later in life that if we had the benefit of social media, things might have been different. And it is absolutely true. That's why a group like Blackpink can take such large breaks between their comebacks because social media is a huge benefit. When they're traveling, they get to take us with them. When they're performing, overseas, it gets uploaded to YouTube. Alas, we're talking about the early 2000s and we simply did not have that. The next single was The Day You Went Away, released in January of 2001. The music video was a little special because it was filmed in the homeland of Norway. And it's a really cute song, really cute video, ominous vibes, but still pop. And I'm not gonna be dramatic and say it was the best song ever, but it's definitely an album highlight for me. The melody is so enchanting. The pre-chorus is my favorite. Marit takes more of a lead in this one. She sings the first verse, unlike the rest of the singles. Towards the end of the song, they pop the hell off. The vocals build, they add a bridge. It was such a strong finish to cap off Shades of Purple. Even though the song didn't perform commercially as well as the rest, this song was definitely for the arts and not the charts. They closed out with a critically acclaimed album that sold more than 1.5 million units around the world. They were also nominated for a Norwegian Grammy the first time since they were kids. They also got to perform at the ceremony. Imagine getting to go home under those circumstances. It must have felt amazing. And there would be a nine month gap before they would start activity on their next album on the tail end of Shades of Purple, they did mention that album two was already being written and in May of 2001, they announced their comeback on their website. The album would be titled The Big Room, simply named after the studio they made it in. And it was a big room because they wanted this album to be recorded with a live band, much like the Beatles. And this era would officially pop off in October of 2001. The first single was Everything and I thought this was a fantastic start to a new era. This song is absolutely about Zac Hansen ghosting her. And I'm just wondering if Mara and Ike were still together at this point or were they both single ladies? But I really enjoyed the song. The opening lines are iconic. It's been nine days, eight hours, 40 minutes, 10 seconds. They were now 17 and 18 looking beautiful, still writing music that was true to them. The music video had, I guess, a desert festival vibe to it because you know, they're big girls now. They were promoting the song in South America, South Korea, and the US. They were on the 100th episode of Dawson's Creek. And M2M, you guys know him? Yeah, Marie and Marie from Norway. They also performed it at the Norwegian Grammys, making this the second time they performed there. And in early November, the album got released in Asia. So needless to say, their strategy was to tour Asia first. In the end of November, they performed everything at the Mnet Music Video Festival, and hopefully they got to meet some first generation K-pop stars. I think that is so cool. When I rewatched this, I found out that JYP has always been JYP. But in January of 2002, they took on an ambassadorship with Pantene Pro Voice. This was a kind of interesting program that was aimed at finding a female singer-songwriter to make famous, I guess. And I don't know that they ever succeeded in their mission, but I do like that they made it a point to highlight singer-songwriters like Ashanti, Fifi Dobson, Jewel, Vanessa Carlton, and Maya. I definitely respect the niche that they were going for. And I couldn't find an exact date, but in early 2002, The Big Room was released to the rest of the world, but there was no single 
single to accompany its release. The first single was in fall and now we were in the new year. So like what the hell is Atlantic doing? And because they released the album in the US, you would think that this would include some kind of US promotion, but absolutely not. As far as I've gathered, they were still in Asia in February of 2002. They were in Singapore for the MTV Asia Music Awards and we wouldn't get another single release until May of 2002. The song would be called What You Do About Me. Once again, no complaints, I really like this song. There are very few M2M songs I do not like, and while most of the songs are written about jealousy and being at odds with another woman, this song, they were actually the other woman. The lyrics go, all she wants is you, all she sees is you, all that you gotta do is set her free. And they try to cushion it with like, I won't let you cheat with me, but girl, you just said in the first verse that he said the L word to you, so that's cheating but I like it. From this point, they've always written about real experiences. I wonder if that was also a real experience. And the music video seemed to be filmed in Thailand. It was really pretty, but this single kind of came and went. At this point, I'm annoyed because this single had a lot of Western influence, yet it wasn't being promoted in the West. They allegedly only spent one week in the US, which the girls found very upsetting, but there were things going on behind the scenes that were out of anybody's control. As I previously mentioned, Atlantic Records was owned by Warner Music Group under Warner Media, formerly Time Warner, who once thought it was a great idea to merge with AOL, AKA the Titanic. In 2002, they lost $99 billion, the largest loss ever reported by a company at the time. So this was very significant. There was no money to allocate to their subsidiaries at this point, leaving M2M to suffer. There wasn't any money to push them on US radio or music channels, which is probably why they were spending a lot of time outside the US for this rollout and probably why there was no single to usher out their US release. But luckily their superstar label mate was about to start touring finally granting them access to the US market. In March of 2002, M2M was announced as the opening act for Jules This Way Tour with show starting in June. The girls were really excited to be touring again. They just got a new band and they were eager to start building rapport with them. And they thought things were going well, but halfway through the tour, Atlantic decided to pull them out and give them a one-way ticket back to Norway. Marit wrote on her official website, I regret to tell you that I am back in Norway and the tour will not continue with M2M as the opening act. The decision was made by our record company and it was completely out of our hands. I feel really bad for those of you who have already bought tickets for the remaining shows hoping to see us, and I'm really bummed out that we won't be completing the tour. Marion would echo these sentiments saying, the tour got canceled by Atlantic Records. They didn't think our records sold enough and our songs were not playing on the radio in the US. This sucks big time. I thought that you should know that. I'll never keep secrets from you and never be afraid of asking me questions. I still hope you guys stick around for me, even though it will be quiet for a while around M2M. And that last sentence was very telling. It seemed that she may have already known what was about to happen next. In the fall of 2002, Marion was on the cover of VG, Norway's biggest newspaper, or so they say, and it was announced that Marion was offered a million dollar solo deal with Atlantic. M2M was dropped from the label and there were no offers for Mary. The article goes on to say that this is the biggest investment for a Norwegian soloist ever and that Marion was to be Atlantic's top priority. It was also announced that the label was gearing up to release an album in just nine months. Upon further research, I found that this was actually legal to the media and I'm definitely inclined to believe so because this was such a bad look on Marion's part. This was literally M2M's disbandment announcement. And sure enough, rumors started to swirl around that this was the end goal all along and it's a huge conspiracy against Marit. And I will say from the outsider's perspective, it does seem like Marit was being phased out during the big room era. They weren't switching off verses as much anymore. Marion was singing almost the whole way through. Marion was the one who had lines in the Dawson's Creek episode and it always seemed like they were dressing Marit in jeans and a simple top while Marion was getting the eye-catching looks. The corset, the crop tops, the designer accessories, bodysuits, bikini tops. I don't know how you put one girl in a corset and the other in a tank top in the same music video. That was so noticeably imbalanced. But in going over a ton of TV, radio, and magazine interviews, I think there's a lot of evidence that points towards Marit going through a burnout, which may have been evident to Atlantic, thus their decision to start phasing her out. There's a really cute blog titled Reflections of a Former Fanboy by a gentleman named Kyle James, and he attended one of their final performances and got to meet them by their tour bus afterwards. He testifies that both girls looked utterly exhausted during the show and he was concerned to the point of asking them, are you okay? Marion appeared frustrated by that critique and she excused herself from the conversation, leaving him to converse with Marit who told him that they were working 18 hour days with very little sleep. On top of that, there was a rumor going around that Marit had fainted before a gig. Ultimately, he concludes, as far as I could gather from her without her directly saying it, the label was running them absolutely ragged. Marit would seemingly 
confirmed this multiple times throughout the years. In a 2007 interview with Stylist Magazine, she said, I wasn't sure that I was going to do music anymore as a job. The second you release an album and go on tour, it becomes a job. It's the best job in the world, but it's just not your music anymore. It's heaven and hell at the same time. That same kind of thing was echoed on her MySpace page in the About Me section she wrote. When I was constantly traveling, going from one place to the next, talking about myself so much that I almost forgot who I was talking about, always thinking about tomorrow and never today, I almost stopped writing songs. It sounds vain, but I almost lost my music. On Marion's end, in a 2010 interview, she said, From the time we started, we agreed that we would quit when it wasn't fun and then it was no longer fun. She further explained, even if you're in a band, you sign contracts as two individual artists. After we decided to quit the group, the record company would continue the contract with me as a solo artist. After all, I wanted to continue working with music. So they both seem to agree that Marit was questioning her career path at this point in time. And what I really want to stress is that both girls also agreed that the split between the two of them was completely amicable. So in the end, it just came down to Marit needing a break and the label continuing with the one that still wanted to work. And that nine month timeline they spoke of sure as hell did not happen. To Atlantic's surprise, Marion didn't want to be a pop star. She fought the label to lean more into a rock sound, which may have been a reason why the album's nine month goal turned into three years. That is quite the leap in time. There is said to be songs that were never released from 2002 with the producer Ole Evenrund. Ole Evenrud. I'm sorry. But after switching direction, she started working with Max Martin and Rami, who birthed Baby One More Time together and just came off of the success of the Britney album. Dr. Luke was also on board, who a lot of people should know. Around that same time, Luke and Martin were working on Since You've Been Gone and Behind These Hazel Eyes for Kelly Clarkson. So they were dabbling into a rock influenced sound at this point, which aligned more with how Marion wanted to sound. And in June of 2000, in five, Marianne's debut album, Here I Am, was released, but only in Asia, Mexico, New Zealand, and Australia. And then two months after that, it was released in Sweden and Norway. The album actually did well in Japan, Malaysia, and Singapore, as well as Norway. She co-wrote all but one song, and I genuinely do like this album. I was able to listen to it the whole way through. She also got to write a few songs with Nikki Six of Motley Crue. The two had previously met at an Alice Cooper concert in Norway, and luckily he was down to work with her. But to Marianne's surprise, the treatment M2M was getting for the Big Room album rollout was now becoming her reality as a soloist. Three singles would come out of this album. Now I'm standing in the this is the but none of them would be promoted in the US. And at this point, there was still no US release date, which was very frustrating for her. And at some point, she either left Atlantic or they dropped her. Most sources do say that she quit. In an interview with Spirit Magazine, Marianne said, I got sick of it and I couldn't take it anymore. There was too much nonsense and it all took too much time. It made me very tired. I invested everything I had to live in New York to work, then nothing happened. It was such a relief and a liberating experience when I decided to leave them and go do things on my own. The conflict between herself and Atlantic and it clearly goes a lot deeper than we know. When her solo deal was announced, her manager said that they were trying to make her the next Shania Twain, and that is so not what we got out of her. So there was obviously huge creative differences. And on top of that, Atlantic was in the process of being taken over by Warner Records, so things were just an absolute mess. And in the end, they ended up phasing her out just like they did M2M. Marion quickly signed to an indie label named 117 Music after leaving, and while Marion was transitioning labels, Marit was moving in silence, she finished up school and waited a while before going back into music. And she would re-emerge in 2004 with a new look under the British label EMI. In October of that year, she performed three new songs on NRK Radio, This Time Tomorrow, Recent Illusion, and Walls. <laughs> I tried looking for these videos, but I had no luck. But according to her Wikipedia, she played the piano and guitar aside from being like the whole ass vocal talent. And this created a lot of buzz around her upcoming album. Her sound had turned really folksy aside from Walls. That song was such a standout for me. It's literally just a poem. There are no repeating hooks, there's no chorus. And you can tell she was really going through it when she wrote this. I was not in Norway when the song debuted, but there's no way that this wasn't the song that had them wanting more. Recording for the rest of her debut album started in 2004 five and under the surface would be released in March of 2006. Four singles came from this album, Don't Save Me, Under the Surface, Only a Fool, and Solid Ground. The first single, Don't Save Me, would reach number one in Norway where it stayed for five weeks. Don't save me, I'll save you the hassle. And 
Under the Surface became the most widely played song on Norwegian radio. She won Best Norwegian Act at the 2006 MTV EMAs, but her greatest victory would come at the 2006 Norwegian Grammy Awards, where she was awarded three Norwegian Grammys, Best Video for Don't Save Me, Best Female Artist, and Best Song for Under the Surface. A fantastic and triumphant comeback. Who would have thought the audience could not stop clapping for her? And she just looks like the sweetest little angel accepting the award, so bashful, so humble. And there are just so many lessons to take from this, not giving up on your goals, being aware of your talent and rediscovering your self-worth because she said herself that she almost stopped doing this. Can you imagine if she gave up? This is such a Cinderella moment. And while Marit was having her moment in Norway, back in the States, Marion would immerse herself deeper into rock music. Now in LA, she started recording her first EP and in the summer of 2006, she had met the artist Meatloaf through the producer she was working with, Hall of Famer Desmond Child. They decided to collaborate on a cover of Celine Dion's It's All Coming Back to Me Now for Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell 3 album. They recorded a music video that was released on VH1 that August and it reached number one in Norway and achieved moderate success elsewhere, including a number two on the UK's rock and metal charts. She would also be the opening act for his tour in 2007. At the end of October in 06, Marion's EP Heads Will Roll was released. This was done in collaboration with Nikki Six once again. The now 22 year old was also getting a sexier image, which is absolutely her right as a young adult. But things got controversial when the music video for Heads Will Roll was published on a website called Burning Angel, which is an alternative corn site. And that did not go over well with fans or the media. The version that was sent to Burning Angel had scenes of women's melons and a clean version was sent to regular television. While Marion does remain covered in both versions, the VG newspaper ran headlines like, Marion's corn stunt and Naked Marion launched on corn website, which probably sounded crazy to people that were just reading the headlines. I don't know who thought this was a good marketing strategy, but this is really the only thing I disagree with. Putting a music video on that website was not making it about you and your song. It was making it about that website and the women in it. They weren't there to see Marion. They were there to see those girls and possibly how much further it would go because at the end of the day, it was on a corn website. Overall, not a career highlight for her. I don't think it was a success in the rock community and and out of all of Marion's solo music, I did not enjoy this body of work. Heads Will Roll does not reflect what the rest of the EP sounds like. It goes into pop rock, which was very confusing because I thought she was trying to get away from that. But I mean like really pop rock, like I can picture these songs in a rom-com. But I did like Heads Will Roll itself and 13 Days. But thankfully she would release a full length album in the summer of 2007 called Set Me Free, with its only single being Falling Away. Falling away and it's not for this album, she was finally able to debut songs from her first album with Atlantic that she was formerly blocked from releasing in certain countries, including the US, so it was finally good to get those out. And the album sold out in Canada, although I could not get an exact number, that's fabulous. So finally, it felt like the ball was rolling for her. Back in Norway in August of 08, Marit released a new single, If A Song Could Get Me You, via her MySpace page. The song shot to number one and so began the era of her second album called The Chase. The full album was released in October and she achieved her second consecutive number one album in Norway. And she played a ton of instruments in this album showing growth as an artist. She was nominated for two Norwegian Grammys, Best Female Artist and Hit of the Year for If A Song Could Get Me You. And in 2009, she was the opening act for Jason Mraz's European Spring Tour. That same year, Marion was recording her third album to be called Nevermore, which I'm obsessed with. Because her last name is Raven, I feel like it's an obvious Edgar Allan Poe reference. It was supposed to be released in 2010, but once again, she would find herself in a bad situation with her label. 11.7 Music was going bankrupt, causing a lot of people on the business side to jump ship. Leaving her without rights to release many of the songs on that album. And because of this situation, she was done with us. Us as in the US. She packed her bags and moved back to Norway and quickly snagged a gig as a judge for the X Factor Norway. Until this point, she had kept a low profile since the debacle of Heads Will Roll. So this was kind of a reintroduction to the Norwegian public. She would eventually release two singles that would have been on the Nevermore album, Flesh and Bone and Found Someone. Apparently people didn't like Flesh and Bone, which I really don't see the problem, and Found Someone was met with a bit more optimism. Found to follow, follow. 
I'm getting the impression that Norway just has an affinity for more pretty songs because Flesh and Bone still had a rock edge to it. All in all, it wasn't enough to win back over her home country just yet. I don't think any of those songs charted. And she would go on to be a judge for Idol Norway a year later, which I do want to circle back to, but I feel like her real Cinderella moment would come two years after that. In 2013, Marion took part in a Norwegian reality show that I will call HGVM. Translation, every time we meet. It brings together a group of artists that live in a luxury resort for a week, and they pay respect to each other by covering each other's songs. Each housemate is to sing a song for each housemate. So so all in all, six artists sang three Marion Raven solo songs and three sang M2M songs. It's been nine days since I was 40 minutes, 10 seconds since you called. I just thought so hard to call compiled them into a playlist and I will link them in the description. Marianne got very emotional when her solo songs were covered. And honestly, I was right there crying with her. I felt like her initial launch was really rough to say the least. She was very mismanaged by both Atlantic and 11.7 for different reasons and her transition from a child to an adult was met with a lot of backlash. First from M2M fans that were bitter about the solo deal and then seemingly the public for being too sexy that one time because she never really did it again. Even her performance performances from that era show her dressed very modestly, so I think people just didn't want to give her a second chance after that. And on top of all of that, as a reaction to Marit's success, people began to push the narrative that Marion didn't have a lot to do with the success of M2M, that Marit was actually the brains behind the operation, and that just couldn't be further from the truth. There are four songs in M2M's discography that were solely written by Marion. Marit has confirmed that everything that was co-written was just that, co-written. So there is absolutely no evidence to support these claims. People just enjoy being mean to her because she's the one that got the solo deal. On the reality show she vented, I felt like I was blamed for everything. I was the mean bitch who had ditched my best friend for a multi-million dollar record deal. I wanted to be an artist. I had no plan B. She also explains that people threw things at her in public, which is absolutely wild. Before reading that, I had no idea it got that bad for her. And finally, hearing her side of the story seemed to have gotten through the general public. Because that show gained 200,000 more viewers than its previous previous season and allowed Marion to start anew. On October 3rd of 2013, she released her first full-length album in six years called Songs from a Blackbird. The album ranked number three in Norway, followed by a nationwide tour. Our girl was back. This album showed a much softer side to her. I wouldn't say that she completely abandons rock. It would be classified as folk rock, which I'm not gonna pretend to know anything about, so I'll just leave it at that. But I'm very, very happy for her. She definitely had to claw her way back to a music career. All the while, her former colleague's music career was just peachy. Marat would continue on with an already fantastic music career. After the Jason Raz tour in 09, she headlined her first German-Swiss tour after releasing If A Song Could Get Me You internationally, where it reached number one in Germany, Austria, and number two in Switzerland. That same year, VG named Under the Surface Best Song of the Decade. In 2011, she released a Norwegian song called Bad Beste Dog, and she bagged yet another number one single. Now in her Tumblr era, she started teasing her next album, which would be called Spark. For this album, she relocated to New York City in need of inspiration, and the result would be 10 new songs with the lead single titled Coming Home. This song found a lot of success in the Philippines where it was number one for four weeks, marking her first number one in PI since M2M's The Day You Went Away. She didn't do too bad in her homeland either. This album would reach number two in Norway. And I don't know why this album is not on Spotify, but let's get that figured out, Marit. In promotion of the album, Marit performed on Idol Norway in 2011, the same year Marion was judging. Oh yeah. This is the first time the girls were known to be in the same place since 2002, which was kind of a big deal, but they would not show Marion reacting to her performance at all, which is is such a waste of an opportunity. These shots are the closest thing we got. Marit straight up said that it was an awkward situation for her because they hadn't talked in a while and she's so real for that. I just wish Norway would have been so messy and gave me some reaction clips from Marion or catching them making eye contact or something. But I got nothing and that's what I have to live with. And luckily it wouldn't be the last resurgence of M2M in the press. In 2014, an academic named John Alvik wrote an entire doctoral thesis for the University of Oslo. Over 200 pages analyzing the success of M2M 
and their solo endeavors, and he was not exactly kind. He acknowledges that they were the first Norwegian act to make it international since AHA, and that no one has really done it since, which is amazing, I had no clue. But then he goes on to make claims of unauthenticity. He said everything I anticipated about Marriott's solo career, calling her image excessive, but like I said before, Oh my god, that was one time! But then he goes on to completely disrespect Marit. He thinks that Marit's persona was invented and strategized after Marion's debut as a more edgy type of girl, going as far as to say that her success was contingent upon Marion's downfall in the press. He says, there's nothing about Marit Larson's persona that is not planned and constructed. There's nothing real, authentic, or natural about this persona. His paper goes on with sections titled Girl Child, Will You Take Me As Who I Say I Am, Fake Naivety, and The Lure of Banality, banality meaning fake, just completely bold, out-of-pocket accusations on her character. He particularly had a problem with her music video for If a Song Could Get Me You, but as a man, I don't think he was aware of the twee fashion craze that was going on at the time. My first reaction watching that was like, oh, she's in her Zoe de Chanel phase. So being a man who is completely unaware of women's fashion, he takes her style as a perpetuation of a harmful female stereotype. He thinks she's trying to revert women back to a time where we were subservient homemakers who were only seen and not heard. Just because she was acting sweet and wearing dresses and I think this is just so emblematic of a woman being damned if you do and damned if you don't. Marion refused to acknowledge the thesis but Mart had a lot to say, you may pause to read. However, the gist of it is saying that she has no interest in reading what some random's interpretation of her 18 year career has been. To which he replied, it seems Marit Larson thinks I'm criticizing her as a person. At no time have I done that. Which is bull, this thesis rocked Norway and rightfully so, he was met with a lot of backlash. Not only from civilians but other people in the Norwegian music industry, causing him to go on this whole gaslighting tour. Like bro, just stand in it. You spent three years writing a paper that nobody liked, okay, sit down. But like a true businesswoman, Marit sees the opportunity to promote her next single, coincidentally called I Don't Want to Talk About It from her upcoming fourth album When the Morning Comes. The song and the album reached number one and she went on a tour across Norway. That same year, Marion also made her live action film debut in a musical called that. So the timing of this paper ended up being very beneficial to the both of them, so I guess everything happens for a reason. In the mid-2010s, both girls would go indie and start their own labels. Both girls would also release two-part albums. Very peculiar coincidence, but also very fun and still very different. It further highlights how incompatible they become musically. These projects sound nothing alike. There was definitely layers to their breakup, but underneath it all, the split was an inevitability. They outgrew each other, and they both outgrew teen pop. And while that would be Marit's last full album for now, Marion would continue to release music. In 2019, she released her sixth studio album and first Norwegian language album that ranked number one on iTunes Norway. Her most recent album came out this year, but she has also done a lot outside of just releasing music. She has seemingly become the Nicole Scherzinger of Norway. She continues to do a lot of TV gigs. She became a panelist on Maskarama, Norway's depiction of the mass singer, which brought in huge viewership over there. She's done voice acting. She's even gone back to musical theater like Nicole Scherzinger has, just all rounders in the entertainment industry. I love to see it. And Marit has not stopped working either. She still tours, both of them do, but Marit has found Found another outlet for creative expression. After getting married in 2016, she welcomed a beautiful baby girl into the world and started writing children's books. She has two out so far and they are translated in eight different languages. And I love that this woman continues to find inspiration through every stage of life. I absolutely adore her for that. Both of them refer to their time in M2M as an important learning process. They got to work with top producers and songwriters and really learn about the industry on an international level. While Marion seems open to an M2M reunion, and Marit has made it clear that she is not interested. That was a really important chapter in my life, but I think it's um it's not always necessary to keep investigating the same collaborations. I don't think it's personal to Marion. In 2020, Taylor Swift put together a playlist for Women's History Month, and she named these women as her faraway mentors. Don't Say You Love Me was in that playlist. Marit posted a screenshot and tagged Marion, so clearly she's not avoiding her. With all due respect, I think the press needs to stop comparing the two. When Marion started making albums in Norwegian, VG ran an article asking why Marit hasn't done so yet, as if it's a competition, and it was really annoying to read through. I could only 
only imagine being either subject of said article, we are never going to get a reunion if we keep pitting these women against each other. They are completely different brands now and neither of them are missing any meals, so leave them be. You're just making things really, really awkward between the two, so like, stop. If you made it this far, I appreciate you so much. This one was a doozy, a lot of translating articles, but this has probably been my favorite deep dive so far. I had a lot of fun making it and I'm kind of sad that it's over. Add me on TikTok and Instagram for short form content and I will see you in the next one. Oh, and let me know who you want me to do a deep dive on next. Girl groups only.